I know a lot about this. I've never watched this. This is with Gaben. This is the whole CSGO controversy stuff, but skins and everything. I don't know what this is going to be, but I will definitely shed a lot of insight. Some, some lore for everyone before we get into this. I started streaming in 2015 and I used to play CS and I used to like to do giveaways, right? The reason I started giveaways because everybody was doing giveaways, but they would give like a $5 skin away every like two hours. I had some extra cash. I was like, oh, I'll invest it to like, you know, maybe bring some new people to stream. I, I had like two viewers. I did $5 skin every like five minutes. There was probably like, I remember at one point I think I had like 50 viewers, right? After some time, I like I would play CS and I started noticing like whenever I play a game, no one would be there. People were just coming in at certain times I had designed for the giveaways and stuff, which is, you know, they used to do hashtag family. I thought I actually built a community. Anyway, I stopped doing the giveaways. And I remember after I announced I was not going to do giveaways anymore, the next stream I did, there was two people in there, me and Nightbot. Everybody left. I remember this dude comes in. I remember it like yesterday. This dude comes in and he goes, yo, Nags. And I was so excited that someone was actually there. And I was like, yo, man, what's up? And I forgot what I was playing. And he goes, yo, giveaway anytime soon? And I was like, nah, man, I, I, don't, I, I don't do them anymore. We're going to be playing this, though. How's everything been? No response. I quit streaming until 2017. Well, 2017-ish. And um, fast forward from 2017 to here. Here we are today. Oh, my goodness. While you might not have seen the visuals or heard the noises that go along with the opening of a Counter-Strike Global Offensive case before, you that will no doubt be familiar with the packaging. What That's you see a is a too. slot machine spinning past what you could have won, teasing you with the idea of riches to be earned. The thing is, though, for anybody who doesn't know skins and stuff like this, um, like, like if you won this knife like right now or anything, you could do one of two things. Or at the time, too, you could literally go to the Steam marketplace, sell this knife for $12.55, and you'll have $12.55 in your Steam account that you could use for games and stuff. Then another way to do it, how it used to be, was you could actually turn it into real, you know, you could turn it into real money. Rolling slots on stream or opening up cases, what do you think is worse? I think they're both equally bad. They're both entertainment, so I, I, I feel like the same, but if I had to pick one, gun to my head, which one do I think is worse? I would go with CSGO skins. I think are worse. The access for kids and, and anybody younger to access opening up cases is far more easier than accessing like a site to gamble like a fan duel or a draft kings or even like a stake for stake you have to go through you have to have a bank account because then you have to convert the crypto take the crypto ship it over there go there win if you want to withdraw you have to go through a process and anybody who's young it's going to be a lot more difficult for them to do that but on steam grab a debit card it's like right there it's it's a it's a lot easier so that would be my only reason is because the loopholes you'd have to go through uh with stuff and something like FanDuel, they're going to want verification you know social security you know all that stuff like to make sure you're actually of age and things so it's pretty and this there was no regulation and stuff when this was going on it's likely landing on disappointment there's a word we use for this in every other area of life gambling the lowest of lows and the highest of highs the thrill that intoxicates the mind these knife openings you could still do today and if you get a knife and someone said i could buy a valve index you literally can't you could buy what is it the um the, the steam deck why am i talking about gambling and showing you a video game loot box well, let's talk about how Valve ruined a generation of gamers, embroiled themselves in dozens of lawsuits, and spawned a multi-billion dollar black market well, I rife remember with this. fraud, theft, money laundering. Oh! I might need to download CSGO now. Stop! If you're gonna gamble on skins or do any of this shit, one, be responsible, it's entertainment. Two, your chance of f***ing opening a knife is f***ing rare, all right? Honestly, I wouldn't. Coined the term massively multiplayer online role-playing game, or MMORPG for short, he used this description for Ultima Online, his creation, Ultima and the largest Online. shared experience world at the time. This game is the origin of many stories and still a beloved title to this day. But what we're focusing on here is how the game influenced monetization in video games. For Ultima and similar games that followed, they charged a monthly subscription fee to play. The idea was that a game which required constant server uptime, updates, and support needed a fixed cost per player to remain operational. It's true, and the first one I played when I was a kid, I must have been 10, Dark Age of Camelot, D-A-O-C. And I remember I, I begged my mom to let me use her credit card, and she said maybe. When I was a kid, I took maybe as probably yes. 
so I kind of borrowed the credit card. This was the model that was widely adopted for similar games across the globe, even in places like South Korea, where a man named Jake Song, along with publisher Nexon, was creating Nexus the Kingdom of the Wind. This trend continued for years, seeing a growth in the industry and an appetite for games that could earn perpetual revenue. After all, during this time, there was no popular use of microtransactions, just the release of a game, maybe an expansion pack later down the line, and now the subscription model for MMOs. Yep. Things were going well, but this all changed in 2003 with the release of a game called Maple Story. I have never played Maple Story. I've heard it a bunch. I've never played. South Korean company and published again by Nexon. So Maple Josh. Story was the first <laughs> MMORPG to take the industry and flip it on its head, in part due to the culture of South Korean gamers and in part due to their foresight about where the industry could go. Wasn't Maple Story? I've never played it. Correct me if I'm... Wasn't it just a ridiculous, ridiculous grind? That's what I've heard about it. I never played it. That's all I know. Nexon designed Maple Story for the heart of Korean gamer culture, PC Banks. Popularized for many reasons, the first being a financial crisis, the second being the booming popularity of StarCraft, and the third being family pressures about playing video games at home if you were even lucky enough to own a home computer. Oh my this god. This is a simple explanation for a complex web of circumstance. The saw the rise of PC god. The 4th of January 2024, Nexon is being fined nearly $9 million for what is being called deceptive loot box practices. The cafe culture domestically, while the business was almost dying everywhere else on the planet. Due to this lack of ownership of computers or consoles in the Korean market, companies started to get creative, experimenting with alternate ways to monetize their game. Nexon capitalized on this fact, designing wow. MapleStory to operate without an upfront cost or subscription, instead popularizing microtransactions in what we now lovingly refer to as a cash shop. Yep. The next piece of the monetization puzzle takes us to Japan in the 1960s. Yeah, that's how far we're going back. Oh, man. A man by the name of Ryuzu Shigeta. Oh, a... so is this going to be the uh, the uh, gotcha um, things you guys always talk about? The, um, you know, the you put the thing in. Machine in Japan housing low-quality plastic toys yeah. inside yeah. PVC balls that open in the middle. You put roughly a dollar in, and out came a ball. This was called a gachapon, though it only really rose to popularity when Bandai came in later, around 1977, and trademarked the term gachapon, which wow. they still maintain to this day. An industry that, according to Wikipedia, has earned them between 3 to $17 billion just in this physical format. Oh, man. At this point in 2003, Maple Story was an utter smash hit domestically in Korea, which led to them exporting the game overseas. In Japan, they decided to make use of the popular gachapon mechanic and implement this digitally in the game. This came in the form of gachapon tickets purchased from the shop for around 100 yen each, which is about a dollar. I don't have a problem with games like gacha games or anything. I, I, I never have a problem, right? I, I do think, though, that there has to be, like, I, I don't know how you even, like, how do you even s stop it from, from kids playing, you know? Because I feel like any adult that has money make their decision they want to play they want to play that's the that's my only that's my only drawback with anything because like I, I don't mind gambling i'm not against gambling i think gambling is awesome as an entertainment form taken with responsibility it's a form of entertainment just like drinking just like other things next honesty pokemon card sets nowadays like you burn through hundreds of dollars on booster boxes before you get anything good. Like to the point you're better just buying the chase card that you want. Believe me, I know. Which is why like um, like uh, a company like DraftKings or like FanDuel or any of those that you see, you know, popping up all the time that do sports betting in this and I don't mind them because the process like they're you have to put in like your social, you have to have an ID verification to be of age and games though, you don't have that. This ticket to an actual gachapon machine in the game and this ticket would allow you to buy one roll. This roll gave you random loot ranging from useless to fantastically amazing. This, as far as I'm aware, is the first digital version of a practice that was already common even for children by 2004. After all, digital loot boxes are just a repackaged version of physical randomized rewards yeah. such as, for instance, card games, which have existed for over a hundred years. Yeah. 
Even today, Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, popular trading card games that utilize what is functionally a loot box system, trading money up front for a game of chance. Yeah. You know roughly what can be in a pack, but you don't know what will be in a pack. It's 100% All true. the people out there saying, oh, but it isn't gambling. Let's all cut the intellectual dishonesty. This is gambling for kids. It 100% needs to be regulated. Yeah, dude, I'm I'm all I'm all for gambling and having fun, but uh, what I'm not okay for is um, having kids the opportunity to gamble. Will it be a big, rare, valuable card, or will you strike out? That's the one that was sold uh, to Post Malone. And even more so when contrasted to the lows from a wasted opportunity from the pack before or after that wasn't quite as exciting. <laughs> Bro, this is something I would do. Well, there is nuance to this. As with card games, you are getting something that has an actual value where you can resell it. Whereas in most video games, you don't have this. Which is a perfect segue to bring us back to Valve and see where they went with their system. On August 14th, 2013, oh, Valve Corporation released oh, an man. update for Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Go. As they described it, a way to experience all the illicit thrills of black market weapons trafficking Next. without any of the day. Yo King, you know, I'm kinda in trouble. Shut up. I need to pay back some people. I promise, I'll pay you back double next month, Kappa. Please tell me there's a group that everybody knows where is that referring to? And at the time, underperforming installment in the legendary Counter-Strike franchise. The premise of this update was simple. Play the game, get crates, buy a key from Steam for around $2.50 US, yep. and then roll the dice. If you were lucky, you'd get an item that would be cool and net you a profit from a few dollars to some of the more expensive skins being a few hundred dollars. Yup, more than Very that, Very quickly, bro. the market was saturated with the cheaper items, making them essentially worthless, meaning every case opening was an almost complete and total financial yep. loss. Despite this glaring issue, this update was probably one of the most successful updates in a video game ever. Looking at the user chart, Counter-Strike Global Offensive went from averaging 50,000 players per evening to doubling their player base month on month on month. Because it, like it was also really cool when you did get that skin. Besides, it wasn't just about the money for selling it and everything. Having such a sick skin like that in the game and one that looked cool, especially some of these knives, just you felt like elite people would. If you had a really good, like a crazy knife, people would like literally like jaw drop. It was a status symbol. You could be shit at the game before you even played. Nine times out of ten you get into the game, everyone's yelling at each other. You walk into that game and you have like a beast, like a Doppler, a Karambit Doppler, like a, a Doppler Ruby, anything like that. No one's talking shit to you at first. And then everything, you know, hits the fan. But for that brief moment, you automatically were looked upon as good just for having six skins. Whenever new cases came out, the game saw a massive uptick in popularity. So for some of this to make sense, we need to explain the systems here. Because CSGO and Valve are different from what other games such as MapleStory were doing at the time. The biggest difference is that Valve operates the largest PC gaming product on the entire planet, Steam. With Steam as a vehicle to distribute products, gather data, yep. and generate perpetual income from other people's activities. Do I have any good skins? Uh, I got rid of them all. I gave a lot to Chad Mom from uh, the ones I had in the past. Um, I think I have some. No, nothing crazy. I've decided to create their own internal economy with what is essentially Steam Store credit. Everything exists within Steam, which means anything you do within Steam is earning them money. Users top up their Steam wallet using real cash and receive a digital representation of that cash on Steam. Although as soon as it enters, they maintain that it no longer has that value. At the time, all you could do- That's what they The do. only law every country has to my knowledge regarding loot boxes, is that they have to show a list of all the possible rewards you can get from that specific box. And it has to include the probability of receiving said rewards. Though some countries have outright banned loot boxes, and games available in a country where loot boxes are banned by law, needs to have them disabled for players in that country. Yeah. Cheer 400. It's similar to like if someone's doing an ad, having the hashtag ad on there, they do have to be displayed. Do with that value was buy video yeah, games. And, and apparently Nexon refuses to give those stats out. On Steam. But in 2012, just under a year prior to CSGO's skin update, which likely was in the works for a long time, Valve had opened what they called the Steam Community Marketplace. Oh. This opened the door for developers, yep. 
any of them that chose to do so, to create items in their games which users could then buy and sell on the marketplace for Steam currency. The community marketplace was kind of a bust on release, as most games didn't use those skins. But it was an interesting development, since before now, almost all skins you bought in any other game was locked to that game. Essentially meaning if you quit, for instance League of Legends, your skins were stuck there and you couldn't do anything with them. You couldn't sell them and then go and buy skins in Valorant with the money or buy other video games, which meant that Steam was doing something completely unprecedented in the industry. This meant that now your digital items, at least on Steam games, had a real dollar value. Yep, wasn't locked into that, you could actually sell it. True, real dollar value. Something that Crazy. didn't really exist. I mean, they always did, but usually only on black markets that would get your account banned if people found out you were trading with other users for real. There was a lot of places you could go for this. I hope they bring up um, CSGO Lounge and yeah, there was a big black market out for it. And then they're probably going to talk about the gambling sites that popped up. Oh boy, this is going to be good. Money, which of course has been a practice in online games going back to the previously mentioned Ultima Online in 1997. Like RuneScape. Where people RuneScape used gold. to sell items, gold or houses within the game for hundreds of dollars on eBay. Essentially, Valve had seen what users had always wanted to do and just brought it front and center, making it perfectly legal to do so within their system. Something that I think is a net good for video games. But of course, this is something that needs to be policed, as we're about to find out. Mm -hmm. Because with the release of CSGO skins, the market had taken on a life of its own. There were skins now valued in the thousands of dollars, oh, which man. was starting to show that the Steam community marketplace had some real bad flaws. This is one of which left the community to find solutions to their own problems. Before we get into those solutions, we've got to introduce something else though. Esports. Yeah, dude, it was all coming in together. Bro, it was all happening at once. Esports was rising. Skins were, were coming up. People were able to bet on the game and you could know that. Oh man, there's so, so much I want to say. You could see that now, bro. Just think about this. Right now, anybody here in America and stuff, uh, well, let's talk America. Bro, betting on, I know many of you don't watch sports, but let me tell you, betting on football and baseball and all of that, if you go back three, four, even five or six years ago, was like not talked about, all right? You had people at literally where breaking your kneecaps came from. You would have to do it under the table illegally. There were only a couple of places. Actually, it was only Vegas. You could bet on sports in Vegas, nowhere else. Couldn't do it in Jersey, couldn't do it in Texas, couldn't do it anywhere else. That was it. That was it. And none of the announcers would talk about a point spread. None of the announcers or anybody would talk about gambling. It was like frowned upon, right? Sports and betting, but people did it, but they did it like secretly. Now, the past like three years, the past three years, two, you can start seeing things like FanDuel, DraftKings, and sports betting. Now sports betting is allowed in Jersey. Sports betting is allowed. It's still in Vegas now in multiple places. Multiple states are popping up where you're allowed to do it. And now announcers are even talking about the spread. That was like a no-no. Nobody talked about the spread. Announcers are like when they're watching the game, they're like, wow, some people are going to be really happy with that kick. You know, talking about it like it's no problem now. Why? Because the betting industry is just, there's so much money to be had and the government and people are starting to see that. This is exactly what happened. Esports was rising, skins were rising, betting on the games. And that's where, like, they'll probably talk about CSGO Lounge came in. It was just money coming in and realized what it could do. You'll talk about teams probably throwing and... Counter-Strike has a long history of professional matches going back over 20 years to the year 2000. Yeah, but Team 3D. real prestige in 2001 with the Cyber Athlete yep. Professional League. The CPL, I wanted to go to that so bad. The Cyber Athletic Professional League. I played on a Cal main team. I was a bench warmer. There was a thing called the Cyber Athletic Amateur League. I played in it. Um, I, bro, I was a kid. I was like 16, 15. And uh, we used a thing called MIRC. So that's where esports like for Counter-Strike originated. Everybody had their teams in a thing called MIRC, if anybody knows what that is. It was like a chat like type thing. And you would have all the pro, like the intermediate teams, the middle teams, the shitty teams, the pro teams in MIRC. Think of it as Discord back in the day, except you can't voice call, right? So they had a thing called Cal. How you became a professional was you won your league in Cal and you worked your way up to Cal Invite, which was the professional teams, right? I made it to Cal M, which is one basically semi-pro kind of, like you're almost right there. Uh, I was a bench warmer. I was on the team, boys. And uh, it was huge to 
to go to the CPL, which was held in Texas, uh, and teams like 3D, this is Team 3D who they're showing right now. There are teams like Weekend Warriors, Team 3D. They, it's, it's wild stuff. With a whopping prize pool of $150,000. Huge at the time. Fast forward to the year 2013, Counter-Strike Global Offensive was now the most popular Counter-Strike title ever created. Pushed to this height in no small part due to the skins, as silly as that sounds. Yup. Yep. As opposed to back in 2001, where there was a couple tournaments per year, Counter-Strike Global Offensive had almost daily small online tournaments, with major international tournaments dozens of times per year. As another contrast to back then, there were now real salaries, real sponsors, and opportunities mm -hmm. involved for pro players. Now let's introduce the first problem for CSGO skins in Steam's marketplace. The skins were considerably more expensive and popular than Valve could have even guessed. Mm -hmm. The Steam Marketplace had a limit of a few hundred dollars per item, and despite a trading system, this was not built into the marketplace, which left users that had or were looking for the most expensive skins in Counter-Strike needing somewhere else. Oh, they're gonna go to CSGO Lounge, but also they used to, I, they're probably not gonna touch on it, but people used to do keys. So you could buy keys to open up loot boxes. People would say like, hey, you had a knife, I'll do, I'll give you 60 keys, right? Kind of similar if you played Diablo 2 back in the day, like I did religiously, items in Diablo 2 were, um, the currency was SOJ, a Stone of Jordan, which was a ring. So it would be like, I want this item, I'll give you four SOJs for it, you know? So they did the same thing, keys, for the item. Add those things together, and what you get is CSGO Lounge. This website popped up within months of the skin market appearing in late 2013, and quickly became the one-stop shop for everything no. CSGO skin related. Essentially, it was a simple user interface that allowed for users to list trades that they were looking for, as well as to advertise or participate in the off-platform commerce of said skins. What I mean by that, is trading real-world money through sites like PayPal, circumventing the usual method of sale, which was always for Steam store credit, which could not be directly converted to real-world currency. This was a huge market, one that was game-changing for how people were interacting with skins. Insane. Now, it was inarguable that skins had a real-world dollar value, but this wasn't the star of the show for CSGO Lounge. Front and center of it all, was e the betting bro esports betting the betting and you would have see these odds bro like 85 to 15 right so you would have clg would be a huge favorite 85 percent you would if you would have put like a, like a knife or two in here what you would get is they wouldn't give you like you know uh, a dollar amount back you would get back a fat ton of skins that equated to you know x amount right in dollars so you would have a shit ton of skins that you would have to have back to your inventory what you would do then is you would take those skins and you'd either trade them up you put them sell them on the marketplace for something big you know like etc it was wild it was it was awesome professional matches of counter-strike global offensive were featured across the website with the ability to link your inventory oh my God. put items up for wager and potentially win skins based on dynamic odds depending on other user bets this was a massive hit and of course, the backbone of CSGO Lounge's existence was their ability to interface directly with yep. Steam's very own API, allowing for users to log in safely and securely to CSGO Lounge with their Steam account, giving Lounge access to certain functions, such as seeing their inventory contents and offering trades. These trades were carried out automatically using bot accounts through Steam that use the API, making the entire process smooth, yep. painless, Easy. and as you guessed it, entirely without checks or balances. This was an entirely unregulated marketplace that was promoting and facilitating gambling of items that had a tangible real world value that could be obtained at almost every step of the way by any person of any age. It's true and there was, uh, I forgot, what is it called? It's off, I could remember the name of it now. That it came out later, it's probably still around today. I gotta think of the name of it, where you could actually pay money to buy the skins and you could also sell them your skins for money. Maybe they'll talk about it here. And this unregulated market was using Steam's very own systems it. to facilitate every transaction. Billions of dollars exchanging hands with what appeared to be zero scrutiny. $41 for a field tested Asimov. I remember I won a bet and I won like 
20 of these. So this is how the layers of gambling worked. You would gamble with real money, purchasing keys and opening loot boxes from Valve, losing almost every time that you did. Yep. Then, with the tendencies of a gambler, you would go to CSGO Lounge, perhaps to trade, see that there was more gambling going on, and perhaps engage in that too. Yep. As you would have guessed, this market was absolutely massive. It exploded almost overnight and was earning unfathomable amounts of money. Another insidious element that existed with CSGO Lounge was that of a stranglehold on the esports scene. CSGO Lounge proved to be tremendously valuable to everyone involved and they made sure everybody knew. Prior to CSGO Lounge existing, the biggest tournaments in Counter-Strike would see modest viewership yeah with because last... people would watch the games they're interested in that but yo if people are betting on it they're gonna get more viewership that's why you see so much nowadays compared to how it was the past like four years with sports that DraftKings and FanDuel are blowing everything up and now people are watching sports right now I, I people are watching more sports but they're betting on it's because they're betting on the games right think about it for you guys you're not sports guys right but for the Super Bowl let me ask, did any of you for the Super Bowl, maybe through a friend or something, did anybody place a bet on the Super Bowl or maybe some prop bets on the Super Bowl? Did any of you guys? No. Well, you guys aren't sports people, but there's there's some. Lounge in their betting audience, the difference was night and day. In fact, the prestige of each game started to matter less and less due to that audience. If you place two games on at the same time, one with two insignificant teams in an insignificant tournament no one had ever heard of, and the other being the biggest match in Counter-Strike Esports history, but CSGO Lounge was taking bets only on the small game, it would- Everybody would be watching the small game and no one would be watching like DreamHack. Would undoubtedly have more viewership uh. for that one simple reason. Yep. And CSGO Lounge knew this, they had the numbers. According to reports from tournament organizers and journalists like Richard Lewis, CSGO Lounge was strong arming these tournaments to give them free advertising on their broadcasts or they would simply withhold betting on their platform for those same tournaments. Since these tournaments live and die from viewership and numbers that they can sell to sponsors, this created a tangled web. Yep. Either promote unregulated gambling and sports betting to your audience, knowing full well many of them are underage, or your product will do worse than other tournaments and probably bankrupt your company in short order. Like you, you literally have to, it's like you're kind of stuck. It's true, you were literally stuck in a crossroads. Because you could have the two best teams, so exciting of a match going on, but this little shit match is going on, but it has skins on the line, everybody's gonna watch this, and you need that to keep the sponsorships flowing, to keep people getting paid, to keep the viewership, to keep everything going. You're literally stuck promoting this. Obviously, CSGO Lounge was a shady website doing shady things, and the people using it were also capable of such activities. While Counter-Strike Global Offensive was now growing in popularity month on month, with the esports scene seeing real sponsors and teams with rosters of salaried players, this hadn't yet trickled down to the lower ranks of aspiring pro players. So of course, wealthy bettors approaching players who earned very little from their playing of the game, telling them to throw matches, well, that was of little consequence. It was of little consequence, and you think that's nothing that's been done before? Plenty of pro athletes and college kids, etc., have gotten caught when walked up to them, hey, you know, just shave a couple of, it's point shaving. We went through this a long time ago, one of the old videos. Just, you don't have to fully lose, just don't lose by a lot. Lose by less than so-and-so, you know, just throw a little bit. And that's exactly what happened. Some pros even just bet on themselves with okay. skins on all accounts and then threw matches to win a few hundred to a few thousand dollars whenever they needed it. You also have to add in these factors. Many of the pros were young, impressionable, active on CSGO Lounge, and deeply addicted to loot box gambling, mm -hmm. skins gambling, and the prestige of having nice items during matches. There was a real pressure here on all levels. These pros were the hardcores, they were on CSGO more than anyone else, and there was a real prestige to skins, as stupid as it sounds, especially in the upper echelon of the game. Yep. So now you had all the ingredients needed for many ruined lives, especially since it was widely known that many professional or semi-professional players were throwing games, yet no actions were being taken, leaving people to believe this was the Wild West and that they could get away with it, which it was, and many of them did, except for a few one of which being the most famous case, and one of the only ones that was ever punished. I buy power? I buy power. Yup! Here we go, boys! Here we go! Oh, I hope they show the clip, especially when he didn't knife them in the back. Oh, man, this is like... Bro, 
This is, I know you guys, like, if I'm, I'm, you know, we do our bets here for channel points, right? And there's been times you've accused me of throwing, and maybe I have, maybe I haven't. I will not answer that. It's not real money, so, but it's channel points. Um, where you say, this is a case where you could say, okay, you threw that, but I never threw. The team was banned. Everyone except Skadoodle of that original lineup was banned. This was a team featuring Steel, Dazed, Skadoodle, AZK, and Swag. A story that was investigated and broken by Esports Hall of Fame journalist Richard Lewis, resulting in a permanent ban of all players involved, Minus except Skadoodle. for Skadoodle. Yeah. The only reason he didn't get banned is when it came time to accept the skins that they'd gotten from throwing the match, he simply declined. The I buy power case may have set a precedent of punishment for those caught fixing matches, betting on themselves and otherwise engaging in illegal activities, but moving forward from here, Valve's involvement in policing their own scene and the chaos that they had created vanished almost entirely. In fact, that's a running theme throughout all of these issues. So let's quickly recap what's been going on within the game. Before we get the recap, so remember, IBP are the ones throwing. God free though. I mean, if they could get that kill, it's even better for him because the mid man doesn't go Here for the go. shot. He's going to try and get the flank off. He's going to have two right there. Can they line up for him? What is he doing? Why did he hesitate so much? Doesn't matter. Has the CZ. Gets one. That was the big clip in question where it got people really thinking. Games ecosystem right now. You had loot boxes released, which were essentially gambling without any of the regulatory scrutiny. A skins market that had ballooned to that of billions of dollars in transactions. Unregulated sports betting that was facilitated with Steam's very own maintained API. As well as illegal activities involving match fixing and reports of worldwide fraud networks or criminals using CSGO skins to launder money. As you can see, Valve had created a monster here. One that was earning their money the more out of control it grew. After all, the skins market was pumping up is. their games, esports viewership, and people playing their game. The transactions on their marketplace were earning them steady revenue and tying up billions of dollars in the ecosystem of Steam wallets, which was money in the door for Valve, but never really left. I really hope they talk about CSGO jackpot. Whether they knew the extent of how rotten things were at this time at is not a question I can answer. But I can tell you if you think this is bad so far. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Oh, we're right? going into it now, so boys. So now it was painfully obvious to everyone on the planet that CSGO skins was an incredibly lucrative market and nobody was really paying any attention. There was also no big corporations profiting from this untapped potential, mm -hmm. which left for many people who lacked moral character. T. Martin and Syndicate, bro. Sorry, so big reason today, well, it was always uh, supposed but while you'll see streamers do sponsors, right? And have hashtag ad on there and you know, state that. A lot of it, uh, well, that's the rules, that's the laws, but I'll let them explain the video, but long story short, him and another person uh, had uh, like owned the gambling, the CSGO uh, skin gambling site and faked their winnings. Like they were winning and they were like, whoa, without declaring to everyone like we own the site. To come in and just basically hose the whole system for millions, billions of dollars. One of the first things these people did was realize there was a fundamental problem with sports betting. Looking at the system, they realized they could only earn massive amounts of money and only when matches were being played, which was not every minute of every hour of every day. It was simply inefficient at taking advantage of the massive amount of money that was available. There was a real obvious solution to this, and that's when things went really, yep. really downhill. Oh, you want it, you f- Oh my god! Right here. Ah! Oh my god, stop green. green, green, please stop. Yes, yes, I'm fucking tweeting green! Yes. Yes. Man, does this seem familiar to like when steak was happening on Twitch? The history repeats itself, bro. It's the same thing. In less than a year of CSGO Lounge arriving on the scene, websites like CSGO Jackpot started to pop up, there offering a simple and effective alternative to those who had CSGO skins to burn and a gambling addiction to feed. <laughs> Boom! Made 1500 bucks. These websites, as the name suggests, were simply casino-style games of chance. The only difference is that instead of US dollars being loaded into a system or exchanged for chips if you were in a physical location, it was bots accepting CSGO skins from your account, which let's remember all represented real world dollar value. That this is a $4,800 pot soda poppins in. I love dick in my ass. Why did I say that out loud? As it was coming out, I realized I f***ed up. These websites were literal casinos without a gamble. Whoa. 
gambling license without oversight without scrutiny and without provably fair systems that let you know what you're doing isn't just this guy what's his name that gold glove or something yeah uh, gold glove yeah, yeah, yeah rigged for you to lose every time you connected your steam account through an api told the website which skins you wish to deposit waited a few seconds for a verified bot from the website to send you a trade request you pressed accept and now you're ready to gamble. And it would tell you the price of how much each thing. Look at this. This knife right here is 1260. 1260 but 1100 for this knife. This is real money. Remember, these bot accounts that were owned by the gambling platforms were simply Steam yeah, user I did. accounts I did. that were automated through an API. Also, at no point during any of this process was there any verification of age, regulatory checks, whether or not gambling was legal in that country. Literally nothing at all to verify fairness, safety, legitimacy, or to protect those society has deemed incapable of making these decisions or having access to these systems. This was not the only thing these websites were doing. They were now also creating their very own loot crates. Yep. Ones that were functionally identical to slot machines, just like valves were. You can look at them both and see exactly where they got the inspiration from. Each crate had a certain value, Contained an array of skins in the CSGO economy, you paid the money, usually in skins you deposited, yep. and then pulled the lever to see what you'd get. Give me a flip knife, Doppler, something decent. Give me the stat track. Yes, dude! What? 280 As bucks. You can guess, all of these websites were generating millions of dollars in revenue on an almost daily basis. And what they did with some of that money was to buy off as many esports tournaments, streamers, YouTubers, and whoever or whatever other ad space they could to push their shady websites onto an unsuspecting audience. These streamers would get a big payday from these, you know, because these sites were making so much money, they would sponsor streamers to go, you know, have CSGO Lotto, you know, up there at the top or CSGO Roll all the way at the top, you know. Why do they do this? Well, very easily, if you've ever worked with advertisers, you'll know the first thing they ever ask you for is your demographics. Every company knows exactly who their target demographic is, the age, the location, the gender, things like that. These companies knew that young males watching esports tournament streamers or YouTubers were their audience that was going to generate them the most money, mm -hmm. and so that's where they were spending their money. It was almost impossible at this time to see a YouTuber, streamer, esports tournament, or any website that talks about esports or Counter-Strike Global Offensive that wasn't sponsored by one or more of these gambling sites. It was like sites. so hard to find. We'll come back to that point a little later. Now, obviously, when there's money to be made and nobody's watching, the real scumbags will inevitably appear. Yep. If you've ever paid attention to how cryptocurrency and NFTs lord Ugh. out the immoral and illegal activities of influencers, well, this is an almost one-to-one -one direct parallel. It really is. And guys, I'm going to tell you this over and over. Um, I don't support NFTs. Uh, I will never do one. I will never be a part of one. I will never sell you guys anything NFT related or crypto related that much. I actually, me personally, I actually really love uh, the, te the technology behind Bitcoin. I actually think it's amazing. Will I ever promote any type of Bitcoin here? No. Will I ever promote any type of NFT? No, absolutely not. Not NFTs. Not at all. Uh, I just think the technology behind behind Bitcoin is really, really cool. When some content creators noticed that the gambling sites could offer up hundreds of thousands of dollars in sponsorships for moderate sized streamers or YouTubers for Next. weeks or months of endorsement. Unless it's the Nag coin NFT, then I'm all in diamond hands to the moon. Shut the fuck. <laughs> some for a few days, a few weeks or a few months of endorsement and we are that valuable to you. Why don't we just cut out the middleman? So that's exactly what they did. Yep. They started making their own gambling websites, promoting them to their audience, and as you would have guessed, never disclosing to that audience that they own so the website. So scummy, bro. They gamble on videos or so streams, scummy. pretending to have suddenly found the best gambling website ever. So scummy. But they own the gambling website. So and we scummy. found this new site called CSGO Lotto. So I'll link it down in the description if you guys want to check it out. But we were betting on it today and I won a pot of like $69 or something like that. So it's a pretty small pot, but it was like the coolest feeling ever. Guys, I found this really cool waifu website, man. And like, bro, I got the sick, I got Albedo, dude. And she's, she's an eight star and it only goes up to eight, man. It's crazy on this site. Uh, waifu gotcha amazing uh, is the name of it, bro. It's sick, but I can own it. No, there's no link. This is what, <laughs> shut the so there's a million and one problems with this scenario, but I'll give you a single example. Honestly, it's really not a bad idea. There would be so much copyright going in on there. I'm not doing, I'm not, bro. I am so far away of that shit. Absolutely not. 
so far away from that. I would not be. Bro, I wouldn't touch that with a fucking 10 foot pole, bro. I would. Example of what one of the possibilities are. Because we have an example of it happening not long after with another content creator by the name of Phantom Lord. So scummy. Phantom Lord owned his own gambling website like many of these other content so creators scummy, did. Bro. But he pretended he didn't, instead acting as if his huge wins in front of an impressionable audience was totally legit. You want to know what's sad too? Is like I was a big fan of Phantom Lord. Giving them the idea that these massive highs of huge pots in skins worth thousands of dollars were just so easy to get. But in reality, as investigated and reported by yet again, Esports Hall of Fame Richard Lewis, there it is. Phantom Lord not only did own the website, but was purposefully rigging the roles to make himself win. Just for clarity, his game required playing against other gamblers. They all put skins into a pot, like and me. whoever won got to keep everything. Which means he was not only advertising something he profited from directly to his audience while lying about it, but he was directly stealing from them at the same time. I remember I was in multiple hands with him, you know, putting my skins in and just excited to be like in the hand, like uh, in the jackpot with them. You know, like I put in like 10, you know, 15 bucks, you know, at a time and used to be so pumped, like be like, oh my God, I'm in this with Phantom Lord. This is so cool because like I was a big fan. Now I just want to make clear what this means as a content creator. The only reason Phantom Lord was ever in a position to be this rich and famous was due to this audience watching, giving him money, value, and supporting him. Right Selling here. them down the river with gambling is already bad enough. But then, while being a multi-millionaire with a career that could last years, earning him potentially hundreds of millions of dollars in the process, deciding to directly steal from them in the short term despite yep. them being the ones who gave him this life but of course, that's exactly what he did. Also, these are just the two most famous examples of websites that existed and things like this that happened, but there are dozens of them, ranging from small to large. I, I'm sorry, Bri, I just remember being at a call with like a bunch of others and it like, um, and we all, he was doing a giveaway for all of us. Um, shit, dude, it's crazy. I watched him every day, bro, I was a big fan. I never want that to happen. I never want that to ever happen to you guys, you know, that you've incorporated me into your routine you know, in the streams in this community, for me to do some stupid shit to scum everyone over, pull some shit like this for a quick grab of cash, all for you guys to be like, dude, I actually, like, I trusted him. Like, I I was a, you know, a loyal viewer, bro. And he, oh my God, that's terrible, bro. Actually, websites, there were hundreds of them. They were popping up almost weekly and still are to this very day. All of them operating in the same manner with the same lack of oversight and all of them using a system created and maintained entirely by Valve. Yeah, so man. why were Valve ignoring it the whole time? The obvious answer here is that Valve was directly profiting from every single level Money. of this. While they didn't- Why would they say something when they're winning too? Control, endorse, or allow these websites to function, they were the major beneficiary of its existence. After all, it would be impossible to claim that they didn't know what was going on. They knew. Everybody knew exactly what was happening. Of course. But most people just ignored it or pretended it wasn't that big of a deal because with skins in the game and the skin economy booming so much, it was raising so much awareness and so many players in the game causing all ships to rise along with that tide. But if you stopped popping champagne for a second and took a look around, skins had poisoned everything around Counter-Strike and it was only a matter of time before people outside the bubble who was profiting from it started to pay attention and maybe even force Valve into taking action. After all, the growth of this industry was utterly insane. Yeah. Reported numbers of just esports betting in 2015, so just two years after skins releasing, was $2.3 billion, with $5 billion in 2016. That is insane. So you could see why now with sports betting on the rise, with DraftKings, FanDuel, and everything, now you're getting the mainstream public uh, and not gamers, like your typical guys that go to the bar and guys are dumb, so we have nothing to talk about. It's like, yo, you see the game last night? Even quintuple all of this. Betting's a big industry. Everybody, again, I'm, I'll never be against gambling, ever. I think it's a great entertainment and it's fucking fun. And done responsibly is awesome entertainment. And projections of this number rising to over $20 billion per year by 2020 if left ignored. That wasn't skins, 
that was just esports betting using the skins. Yeah. And that's just such a niche so market. So in June of 2016, the first lawsuit happened. A Connecticut resident by the name of Michael McLeod initiated a lawsuit against Valve. This lawsuit alleged that Valve knowingly created and facilitated illegal gambling by their creation of the new currency CSGO skins, while also profiting from that industry, which potentially allowed miners to participate. There it is, the no age verification. That's that's the big that's the big thing. I remember when this happened and they gave a month for all these other sites like CSGO Lotto and Roll and all these, you know, to now start removing the APIs and not be tied to it. And it gave like a month to let them, you know, uh, to do it. But I remember when this hit, it was like a blow. And then CSGO Lounge, everything was just like it, 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 it was done so quickly. It's still up today. Well, not CSGO Lounge, but they're still gambling for skins today, but it's like super shady now. Multiple Super other shady. lawsuits appeared, including a class action, but all of them ended with the same outcome, with Valve's lawyers successfully having the cases dismissed for various reasons. None of this addressed the elephant in the room, that CSGO had in fact created a currency and maintained systems that were facilitating an entire black market of unregulated gambling that did include miners. Instead, Valve's lawyers successfully argued that they did not create the gambling websites, which is true. Yeah, because they, they those, those sites use the API. Promote their use, which is also true. In one such specific case, parents argued that Valve's games, systems, and skins had caused their child to participate in gambling as a minor. They lost this case. It was successfully dismissed when the judge ruled that the parents had never played the game themselves, so the parents lacked the standing to bring such charges. Oh my god, bro, the amount of when you're value, you have the money for the lawyers, bro. You ain't winning that. They have Now, the obviously, money. common sense wise, everybody knows looking at this what's going on, but the laws have not caught up with what's actually happening, and nobody could argue against Valve's lawyers in a court of law. Regardless if on the face it's so obvious, that's just not how things work. Luckily, there was one case of a singular regulatory body taking notice and saying, hey, something's not right here. That was the Washington State Gambling Commission, Gambling Commission, who contacted Valve in February of 2016 and raised concerns over the facts of what I've just laid out for you. Specifically stating that Valve was allowing these companies to operate using their API. Everybody's losing Gambling Commission walks in, yo. What's up, little bro? What are you guys doing over there? <laughs> Which is true. Valve's response to this at the time was to deny their involvement. Again, the same as the lawsuits. They essentially said, we didn't break any laws and we can't do anything in order to stop the gambling websites. The Washington State Gambling Commission disagreed with this and gave Valve until October yeah. 14th to yeah. quote, immediately stop allowing the transfer of skins. That for was the stop of the API though. Civil lawsuits, I sleep. Federal entities, real shiz. <laughs> Gambling activities through the company's Steam platform, or they would face legal repercussions, potentially even criminal charges. Now, just to give you the timeline of events here, up until this point, Valve had ignored this entire issue. This multi-billion dollar black market of fraud, illegal activities, unregulated gambling, all of it. After the commission had contacted Valve in February, a couple months later in June, despite claiming to have done nothing wrong and being unable to prevent the use of their API, Valve had their lawyers send out a cease and desist to 23 different gambling websites. Yep. Most of the websites on this list closed down almost immediately, yeah. proving that Valve did and continues to have the ability to crack down on this market if they want to. If. They did the whole time. Yep. But you have to remember, we're talking about the past here. This happened in 2016, and a quick Google search shows in 2024 that there are still, there still there are two government agencies you can't win against. That's the IRS and the Gambling Commission. You spelt gambling and commission wrong. Tons of casinos out there using CSGO's <laughs> brand images, skins, and much more to run casinos. It's still and going there's on. Little yeah. to nothing done to prevent their progress. So moving on from Valve's system they created that has facilitated billions of dollars in illegal activities, and going back to Valve's system of gambling with loot boxes, there are two examples that I could find of regulatory or legal consequences for this system. 
Netherlands and Belgium have been ahead of the pack in banning the sale and use of loot boxes, such as the weapon crates in Steam's game Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Wow. And there has been one lawsuit that concluded in December of 2023 in Austria, where Valve was ordered to pay back 14,000 euros to a customer. This number was what he'd spent on CSGO loot boxes in what the court called illegal gambling. This mother ah. lost 14k on skins and he got a rebate. Holy shit, I wish! Court pointed out that Valve does not have a gambling license, an argument they made in a similar case involving loot boxes against EA and Sony. Which lines up, of course, perfectly what all of us know, but people couldn't successfully argue in many US court cases against Valve in the last eight years. That using real money to spin a wheel that returns something worth real money is, in fact, gambling. Just because it's in a video game does not change that fact. So I'll give you now an example of where the law having strict applications is circumvented even in the face of common sense. So let's go back to Japan, as we did oh with the creation boy. of Gachapon and digital loot boxes. In Japan, most gambling is illegal. Casinos are not allowed to operate with games of chance. Oh. But you will notice that Japan has a massive industry called pachinko machines. The system of pachinko is very simple. You enter a pachinko parlor, you exchange real money for pachinko balls. Unlike traditional slots in a real casino, winning rewards you with yet more pachinko balls, which you can then trade for prizes. These prizes do not convert to real world money, mm. unless you go to another store, which is conveniently right next door, where you exchange your prizes for real money. What? That's how it works? So wait, if I go to Japan and I, I wanna I wanna gamble. Right? I can't go to a casino or anything. I go to a pachinko, like I go to a place like that. I get, I pay, I say put $100, right? I get a bunch of pachinko balls. I play in the machine, more balls come out. I take all the balls, right? I could either get prizes there or I could go around the corner, be like, yo, buy my balls. No, you get a prize and then sell the prize. So like I, I buy a prize of like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, a coffee mug. I go to the place and I, I'm like, I got a coffee mug. So it's like a pawn shop. And I'm guessing that those places to make money, they undercut giving you the money on what that prize is. You could profit, but they a lot less. They make money, you get some money, it's not gambling. This is a single layer of abstraction, and that's all it takes for a $200 billion per year industry of gambling to operate in a country that deems this practice to be against their criminal code. This is how easy it is to circumvent the rule of law so long as no one has an interest in upholding the spirit yeah. of the law. Yeah. That's exactly where Valve is at with this system. When they say, we didn't break any laws, they might be right. But what they and many other companies have done to make billions, tens of billions of dollars is to exploit a system that anybody can look at and say, common sense, this is what that is. Yeah. So I wanted to use this specific example because it clearly illustrates how everyone involved can know something is what it looks like, and yet legally it never be treated for what it is, as well as to come back to Gachapon, which started in Japan and has now infected the games industry with what is more loot box mechanics. Gacha! Though now people call it Gacha and somehow pretend it's not as bad with that new and more palatable name. I remember this. Ah. The only difference between Gacha in games like Honkai Star Rail, Genshin Impact, or any other number of similar games, and the system that Valve created, is that Valve's system can be viewed as having tangible, real-world returns of value. Actually, is worth that. They still both function in the same areas of the brain that have been proven in multiple studies across the globe to harm those who participate. Those who gamble in video games with what we call loot boxes and gacha, whether a financial reward is on the table or not, are more likely to develop problems with more gambling activities, have higher stress, anxiety, and a lower quality of life. There is little to no doubt that kids being introduced to these systems that are designed specifically to make them more likely to spend greater sums of money has already caused a massive uptick oh in gambling addiction God. and associated issues in our society. Clearly, there's problems here. Very real regulations need to exist to stop companies like Valve from using mechanisms proven to ruin lives 
just to generate billions of dollars in profits. If common sense and the studies don't do anything, anecdotally, you can go and view hundreds, thousands of stories. I'm sorry, I gotta read this. My fiance is addicted to loot boxes. He spontaneously admitted to me a few months ago that he spent more than $1,000 on some app or other. He likes those lol type apps or something. I told him that I was glad he decided to tell me that I wasn't angry and to please not do this again because we cannot afford it. We live together. He was good about it up until about a week ago, only spent money on a PC game subscription. Then he downloaded some new app and he was super obsessed with it. I even asked him once or twice if he had spent money on it. He told me he didn't want to make that mistake again and to please him. And he said no. I took him at his word. Turns out he was lying. Tonight he called me over and asked me to put a parental lock on his phone so he can't make in-app purchases. I did, then asked why and he told me he spent over 400 in the past week. We've talked and it's all good and he truly wants to stop and he wants me to stop from spending any more. You know, that's, it's bad, you know, that he did that and kind of like, not lied, but, you know, in a way, not super truthful there. But at least he saw it and was like, hey, I want to talk to you about this. Let's just lock the account. Giga Chad girlfriend for dealing with that. Giga Chad guy for understanding that, hey, I've been doing a little bit too much. I think I got an issue here and uh, being responsible. Awesome. Love to see that. Now I want to know, can he get around the... <laughs> She's a Giga Chat thinking, bro. Smart on her. She is a Giga Chat right now. Now, I want to know, though. Really happy he came to me. We locked it up. It's good. But, hey, Reddit, I need to know. Can he get around the parental lock when it's... Uh, she's smart. And to bring the overall conversation back to gambling in video games and its impact on society, especially Us the younger too. generation, I'd like you to consider something. Yeah. Gambling in the real world is not good, in my opinion. As somebody who's grown up with a gambling addict, as somebody who's lost friends in real life to gambling addiction who took their own life, there are some checks and balances society has overall decided is good, such as being over 18 to gamble, being able to impose restrictions on your account, things like that. On top of this, gambling is rarely ever observed on a daily basis in most people's lives. True. Kids or young adults, or even adults in general, are not exposed to societal pressures or triggers as a matter of living an average day. Sure, there's gambling ads, there's movies and things of that nature, but it's not like you see somebody wealthy in the street and immediately think, oh, he gambled for that, and therefore have it glorified in front of your eyes. We think well, we about that if someone has a lot of channel points. Well, the ah. he gambled for that, bro. Video games, this is almost a persistent factor in kids' lives. The video games people are playing by and large, especially younger people, are the ones that are popular in school, the ones that other kids are playing. And having valuable, limited, or otherwise cool and coveted items in those games is seen as a social symbol. Did you just call him I Show Meat, bro? Yeah, I remember that when that happened. <laughs> Can I show meat? That has real cachet among their peers. When I was growing up, it was clothes and Pokemon cards. Yeah. Nowadays, much of it can be what skins you have in the video games you all play. On top of this, these kids and young adults are watching YouTube videos, TikToks, live streams of their favorite players and personalities. Next! Always. Gambling Always is wrong. wild here in Finland. You have slot machines in every market and before recently it wasn't that uncommon to see kids gambling on them. Yeah, I remember I, I asked uh, a lot of you, you, uh, you guys, like there was, uh, you know, um, a lot of like gambling places like on, you know, every couple of blocks, you know. Especially like the UK. I don't know what they call them. What do you guys call them? Is that it? Betting shops. Betting shops. That's it. Betting shops. Or bookies. I've heard both. Bookie, we have a different term here for bookies as in like a bookie here in the US. Maybe it was a little confused when I said it earlier. A bookie here in the US. Before gambling for sports got really big now the past like four years, you would have someone called a bookie. There was usually the bookie was the guy you pay, but he's usually working for another guy who's working for another guy who's working for the guy that'll, you know, break your ankles. His job was to collect. Then that bookie collects from the other bookie, from the other bookie, and then pays that guy. That was, that's, that's like here in America, you used to do it, you used to either call, or in the old days, you used to call, place your bet, but then as time gone, you used to do it like online through a bookie that, you know, had a website that was like a secret website that you could put it all into track. Anyway, yeah, bookies and, and yeah, the betting shops. Say mouse, headphones, mouse mat, whatever it is. And inevitably, this comes back to what skins and cosmetics they have too. They're watching these people that they idolize gamble on these items, and it's totally normalized. If we consider that adults can get hooked on gambling, what exactly do we think is happening to kids that lack the mental capacity of an adult, but are also exposed more frequently and with more constant pressure to these same or worse systems that are even more accessible? 
And why is this industry being ignored as if it isn't plainly obvious to everyone involved exactly what's been happening now for over two decades? Insane. Maybe I'm too close to this, but I'd argue that gambling mechanics like gacha or loot boxes in video games is worse in almost every conceivable way than gambling in an age-verified and regulated environment well, based yeah. on my understanding of both. And I'd argue that we've not seen the long-term ramifications of these businesses exploiting legal loopholes or lack of regulation to generate unfathomable wealth at the cost to the minds of those who will be responsible for the future. Much of this video focuses on specific examples of this concept, with what I'd consider to be one of the most egregious but also the most interesting example of a system created using loot boxes and skins. Valve created Let's their own go, economy, baby. which spawned literal black markets Nag of fraud, theft, lie. money laundering, and everything in between. But let's not kid ourselves, the practice of loot boxes and gambling in video games that have no regulatory oversight and no gambling license is widespread across the industry. And as for Counter-Strike Global Offensive, The Guardian posted an article at the back end of me writing this video, and according to their research, over 200 of the top 300 streamers for Counter-Strike Global Offensive on Twitch have sponsorships from some of these gambling websites yeah. which goes to show despite valve cracking down that one time in 2016 the problem still widely remains yeah. what it looks like to me is that regardless of if regulatory discussions are now ongoing they've taken way too long a story that's too often true when it comes to emerging technology that falls into the blind spot of government for far too long but there we go thanks for watching it's it really comes down to regulation comes down to regulation because you're never going to get, get away from gambling is too much of a money maker and that's why sports is transitioning over to more uh you know mainstream sports where it's kind of like being okay to gamble you know to you know use a promo code for DraftKings, FanDuel, etc it's just there's so much money to be made and companies understand that what is not and gambling in my opinion well when regulated and entertaining is you know i don't find the problem with that obviously it has some just like drinking right you could have an alcoholic you could have someone who has a gambling addiction that's both terrible, you know, and, and sometimes that and that happens and that's sad. But in the overall, if regulated and um, with the correct laws, keeping minors away, you know, um, you really can't stop it. You can't stop it. Addictions will be there forever. Survivor.